Thanks very much. You're all very welcome indeed. In fact, it's a very special year, 2013, for the Faculty of Dentistry. It's our 50th anniversary, and uh, this is the crest of the faculty that you see on the screen here, uh, formed in 1963. The chair that you see here is out in the uh, main hall by the front door, and anybody who wants to go back and visit old memories, I'm sure you'll feel comfortable sitting on that one. It's not the role of this presentation to explain a huge amount about periodontal disease, but more to talk about the uh, relationships between systemic disease and periodontal disease. But it's important that we realize, despite all the research that has gone over many, many years, that there's still a lot we need to learn and a lot of research that needs to be done. In the broadest terms, uh, periodontal disease comprises both of gingivitis and periodontitis. Periodontal health, which we see here in front of us on this screen, is where we have a lack of inflammation, we have normal functioning and aesthetic dentition. Gingivitis is inflammation of the gum tissue, and it's usually a non-destructive periodontal disease but I won't bore you with the many different types of gingivitis that you could encounter. Periodontitis, on the other hand, is basically a destructive component where uh, the bone and the attachment uh, of the soft tissues is lost from the tooth, as you can see in the diagram. In periodontitis, it can be very mild, moderate, severe, or extreme extreme to the point where the teeth are lost. And periodontitis can be chronic or it can be aggressive. And here we have a 44-year-old gentleman with severe periodontal problems, except he didn't realize he had them. And that's very often the case with periodontal disease. Patients are relatively unaware of the problems they have. They may be aware of bleeding gums. They may be aware that their gums are receding but they may be largely unaware of the severe bone loss that you can see on these x-rays here, because the bone should be up in this region, and you can up in this region, and you can see where it's been lost. Periodontal diseases are common and affect um, a lot of people right the way around the world. And mild to moderate forms affect 30 to 50% of adults and severe forms affect quite a smaller number, 5 to 15% of adults in the US. <coughs> and periodontitis has an either, even higher prevalence in developing countries, and there's quite a, an amount of global variation. In addition to socioeconomic factors, periodontal health status is related to several factors like modifiable risk factors such as tobacco use, excessive alcohol consumption, diet, psychological stress, and insufficient oral hygiene. And these you know, principal risk factors for periodontal disease are shared by other chronic diseases. The cause or etiology of periodontal disease is multifactorial and dental plaque is the initiator. We need plaque as the initiator. But all persons are not equally susceptible to periodontal disease, and certainly I have found out as a clinician over many years, all do not respond equally to therapy. The manifestation and progression of periodontitis is influenced by a wide variety of factors. And these are the microbial composition of the dental plaque itself, which is several, several chapters in a book. Tooth level or local factors, things like grooves in the teeth or bifurcations. The social and behavioral factors, things like smoking. Genetic factors, systemic factors, which we'll talk about later on, and other emerging risk factors like viruses. And this is something which has been studied a little more recently. And a uh, viral cause for periodontitis, uh, the research in that is marking a turning point 
in periodontal research, where for the previous many, many years, it was considered to be exclusively a bacterial etiology. And Epstein-Barr virus and CMV are the most commonly researched viruses in periodontology. Periodontitis can be a manifestation of many systemic diseases. In most of these systemic diseases, there's either decreased host resistance to infections or changes in the actual gum connective tissue. And these increase the susceptibility to inflammation-induced breakdown. Systemic diseases adversely affect host defense systems and act as risk factors for both gingivitis and periodontitis. Depressed neutrophil or white cell number and function, and you may see that in Down syndrome, papillon Lefebvre syndrome and others, have been reported in association with severe periodontal disease. The neutropenias and other blood disorders or blood dyscrasias may have profound effects on the periodontal tissues, as you can see in this slide here, where there's a sloughing grey appearance to the gum tissues. And examples include diabetes, osteoporosis, renal dysfunction, immunodeficiency diseases, obesity, stress, pregnancy, and certain dietary deficiencies. Although bacteria initiate periodontitis, host-modifying risk factors appear to influence the severity and the extent of the actual disease itself. Periodontitis has been associated with increased morbidity and mortality of cardiovascular disease, stroke, pregnancy complications, and other medical illnesses. However, Determining the role of periodontal infections in non-oral diseases is fraught with difficulties and the nature and strength of the relationship between periodontitis and non-oral diseases have been the topic of significant debate and will continue to be so. There are certain questions we should ask. For instance, who will develop periodontitis? Could it be me? Could it be my sons or daughters? How can we predict it? What systemic impact will periodontal disease have? And what effect will systemic disease have on the periodontium and oral soft tissues? Over the past number of years, we've learned a lot about the relationship between risk factors and the development and progression of periodontal diseases. And data coming mainly from cross-sectional studies have identified things like infrequent dental attendance, and certainly the government are doing a lot to help us there at the moment, um, smoking, diabetes, stress, genetic factors, as well as specific bacterial species as possible risk factors or risk indicators for periodontal disease. Clinical experience shows that these factors not only increase the probability of developing periodontal disease, but they're critical in the prevention and treatment of the disease. And assessing the patient's risk profile is of the utmost importance for the success of treatment. And the objectives of treatment have to be determined on the basis of the patient's needs and based on the patient's risk profile. So we can help by using a risk profiler. And here is one that I designed with a colleague in the States, Bob Jenko, in 1998. You're not expected to read this, but it's a one-page uh, document that the patient fills out in the waiting room. And we use that in association with a medical health questionnaire. So it's allied to the medical health questionnaire, which the patient fills in, and then it's reviewed by the clinician. The purpose of our initial consultation is to collect all the relevant information and help define the patient's profile. And we need to find out certain things about patients, their general health, their socioeconomic background, and their dental history, and of course, their chief complaint. And our diagnostic procedure should enable us to identify risk factors or risk indicators that can influence treatment decisions and treatment outcomes. 
it's well recognized that socioeconomic level is a good marker of various risk factors for periodontitis, such as oral hygiene, provision of dental care, behaviors, and ethnicity, and therefore this factor may be a good indicator of the, the level of periodontitis in a particular population. And several studies have reported a strong association between a low socioeconomic level and high risk of periodontal disease. In terms of age, uh, we know that uh, the disease uh, tends to roughly level off later on in life. It becomes uh, less active. And in aggressive periodontal disease, we see that mainly in younger patients. So if it's going to occur in young patients and they have significant risk factors, the progression of the disease in the younger patients can be quite rapid and then peaks later on in life. And this is particularly important to know when we're dealing with children and young adults because periodontal disease does occur in that age group. However, luckily, periodontal disease in children and adolescents complain, uh, comprises mainly of gingivitis, just inflammation. And there are few cases where marked destruction of the periodontal tissues are observed. And in prepubertal or periodontitis occurring before puberty, these patients may have related systemic diseases that compromise the patient as a host and also compromises their response to microbial plaque. These early onset diseases in young patients prepubertal or just after puberty, many of these cases are rare and evidence is based mainly on case reports rather than uh, significant studies. But it's important in these patients to consider systemic disease backgrounds uh, in our diagnosis. But luckily, most children are normal. Common things, as we know, are common. And the majority of young patients have only gingivitis which can be corrected by simple measures. Here's a case, a 15-year-old boy, no relevant medical history, presenting with loose teeth, drifting, spacing, and red gums. And he has quite a bit of mobility or looseness in his front teeth. And you can see that the front teeth don't look normal. When we look at the lower front, we see there's a lot of spacing there as well, and we look from the palatal aspect of the uppers, and you can see that his teeth have moved significantly. And why is that? Well, when we look at the x-rays, we see that he's lost a significant amount of bone support around his teeth, and he is only 15 years old. So this isn't your common form of periodontal disease. In the older days, it was known as juvenile periodontitis. There's a large body of evidence that uh, in adults, males are shown to have a higher risk of developing chronic periodontitis than females. And periodontitis is more frequently diagnosed in men than in women. However, in children, this is less well defined. Here's another young patient. She presented because she had had an infection recently in one particular area, had been given some mouthwash which resolved her problem, but she was concerned she was getting some spacing in her front teeth. And although her gum tissues look generally healthy, when we start looking at the radiographs or the x-rays, we find she has a lot of bone loss, and yet she's only 23 years old. The difficulty with these young patients is that the potential for them to lose their teeth is very, very significant when they present with disease so early on in life and beautiful dentitions and smiles can be lost very easily if the diagnosis isn't made early and the treatment effective. Maintaining the gum condition after treatment is extremely important and a number particularly of Swedish studies have showed that very long-term follow-up that good plaque control, good oral hygiene 
is central to achieving and maintaining good long-term periodontal health. Also, genetics plays a role. Many genetic studies have been carried out and particularly aggressive periodontal disease has strong genetic components and it's much more prevalent within families. Here's an example, a 12-year-old boy. We can see, looking at this slide, he's got multiple infections and despite the fact that he's a 12-year-old boy, his oral hygiene isn't that bad and yet he's got severe problems. You can see how his teeth have moved and the interesting thing is that both of his parents had lost their teeth by their early 20s. So significant uh, genetic factors here. And here is his x-ray. He's lost a huge amount of bone support around his teeth in a very, very short period of time because some of these teeth are only barely in the mouth. But also the interesting thing when I saw this boy walk through the door was that he had thickening of the keratin layer on his hands and he had uh, also the same on his feet. And he was suffering from a condition called Papillon Lefebvre syndrome, which is um, uh, manifest here from the cutaneous point of view, but also in his mouth in terms of the destructive periodontal disease. So, moving on to chronic periodontal disease, which generally occurs in the adult population, it can present in many different ways. And it's been well established from twin studies that genetic factors may contribute substantially to the risk also in chronic periodontitis. And here is where genetic factors can play a role. This young man of 33 presented because his sister had a recent diagnosis of early onset periodontal disease and he had noticed a little bit of spacing and despite the fact that his gums generally looked healthy, he had an examination which revealed that he had in fact significant periodontal or gum problems and he was at risk of losing his dentition. In conclusion, genetic factors could be responsible for the different characteristics that distinguish chronic periodontitis from the more aggressive forms. However, we still, as always in medicine and dentistry, need more research. More recently, a number of studies have indicated that patients with periodontal disease may be at increased risk for adverse medical outcomes the increased risk appears to be independent of other known behavioural and medical risk factors and also appears related to the severity of the periodontal disease. This goes back a very long time to the focal infection theory of Miller who postulated that a role for bacteria in the uh, etiology of what was then called pyorrhea or periodontal disease and concluded that m the presence of predisposing factors, many bacteria were found in the mouth that can cause periodontal disease. And he advocated also that such bacteria could play a role in many other diseases in humans. And he coined the expression, the focal infection theory or focus of infection. Periodontitis has been linked to coronary heart disease as a, poten a potential risk factor. Its association with stroke has been less well studied. Periodontitis shares a number of common risk factors with cardiovascular disease, such as age, male gender, socioeconomic status, and most importantly, smoking. Therefore, the question arises as to what the nature of the association between periodontitis and cardiovascular disease is. Does it arise because of interaction between confounding factors such as smoking or is it truly causal in nature? Cardiovascular disease and periodontal disease are both chronic inflammatory diseases. Numerous cross-sectional long longitudinal epidemiological studies 
have provided evidence that there is an association between periodontitis and elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. And in the last 10 or so years, a rising number of investigations have studied the possible association between chronic oral infections and cardiovascular disease. And these studies were based on the hypothesis that periodontal disease may confer an independent risk for cardiovascular disease. However, there still is controversy whether these associations are causal or whether there are common etiological factors common to both diseases. And we really do need to bear that in mind. The answer is still unclear. And recent studies have focused on the systemic effect of periodontal intervention or treatment on indicators of cardiovascular disease, such as serum markers of inflammation, serum lipid levels, and measurements of endothelial function. In the association between periodontal infection and cardiovascular disease is causal, effective periodontal treatment should lead to improvements of systemic inflammation load. And successful periodontal treatment could lower the risk of cardiovascular events or even prevent onset and progression of the disease. According to the available data, periodontal interventional therapy has a positive impact on established risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And these interventional studies have strengthened the evidence for an association between periodontitis and cardiovascular disease and indicate but do not prove a causal link. Achieving and maintaining oral and periodontal health is an integral part of the holistic approach to general health, along with other health promoting behaviors like healthy diet, exercise, and smoking cessation, which certainly the dentist can play an important role in. And the dental team must assume an important role in the control of such risk factors and promoting a healthy lifestyle. We've long known that diabetes is associated with periodontitis and is a true risk factor for periodontal disease, clinically associated with increased susceptibility to infection and individuals who have both types of disease, uh, both types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, are at increased risk for periodontal disease. And children and teens with diabetes show accelerated periodontal destruction, which is related to the metabolic control of the diabetes. Periodontal disease is more severe and prevalent in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes on the basis of multiple global studies. And large-scale studies, particularly in a group of Pima Indians in the US, have shown significant associations between periodontal disease and diabetes, and both type 1 and type 2. Here's a diabetic patient, 32-year-old male, insulin-dependent, poorly controlled, and everything about the patient is somewhat non-compliant. He's overweight, he's poor oral hygiene, and he's poorly motivated. I saw him for assessment, he declined treatment, and the next time I saw him, he wanted the implants. So what's the risk that now, wishing to have dental implants, that he will maintain his implants over the rest of his life? Are his risk factors still the same in terms of his implants as they were for his natural teeth? Because his lifestyle isn't going to change. Also, the duration of diabetes measured by the age of onset was found to be an important risk factor for future potential destruction. And individuals with poor metabolic control of their diabetes had increased attachment loss compared to well-controlled subjects, despite similar levels of oral hygiene. Here is an unfortunate case, 29-year-old, diabetic since childhood, insulin-dependent, poorly controlled, and additionally smokes. 
Unfortunately, this lady died of diabetic complications about two years after this slide was taken. Interestingly, the reverse possibility that the periodontal infection may exacerbate the diabetic condition is now receiving increasing attention. This has been looked at in several studies and is still ongoing. Worsening periodontal disease adversely affects glycemic control, so it's harder to keep uh, it under control. And it's been suggested that inflammation may be one of the links between the two diseases. And treatment of periodontal disease, especially in patients with uh, elevated glucose levels, imp improves glycemic control. Gestational diabetes is another area that we're interested in nowadays. And it occurs in about 7% of pregnancies. And it's a multifactorial disease associated with a long li list of risk factors. Prominent among these are infection and systemic inflammation. And it may be the indicator of future development of diabetes and periodontal disease. Certain types of gingivitis and periodontitis have been shown to be uh, quite destructive and particularly in immunocompromised patients or malnourished or stressed individuals. In Europe and the US, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis or periodontitis develops primarily in adolescents and young adults and especially in HIV-infected individuals, and almost never in young children. This is the type of destruction that can be seen of the periodontal tissues. Also, patients on renal dialysis have been found to have higher prevalence of periodontitis. These patients are very often on significant amounts of medication to prevent rejection of their a donor organ. And approximately 30% of these patients who are medicated with drugs like cyclosporin and about half of the patients medicated with both cyclosporin and nifedipine, which is an antihypertensive or blood pressure reducing drug, experience clinically significant gum overgrowth that requires treatment. And here is an example. This lady was finding it difficult to eat. Her gums had overgrown so much. And the fibroblasts, or the cells in the tissue, get switched on by the medications and proliferate. And we carried out some treatment for her. And as you can see, uh, things improved quite significantly. But it's believed that a number of things are important. The duration of drug therapy, and of course the drug therapy itself, the level of plaque-induced inflammation, the susceptibility of those fibroblasts I mentioned, and also related genetic factors, because genetic factors also seem to play a role. And these coming together are pivotal in the development of drug-induced overgrowth. Periodontitis has been associated also with other diseases and conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis, which has also been linked to certain viruses, and with a variety of renal diseases, which have also been associated with CMV and other viruses, and also with premature death from neoplasms and from vascular and digestive disease, which can have a herpes viral etiology. So here's a patient, 43 years old, with arthritis and severe periodontal disease. You can see the extent of the disease here, effectively getting long in the tooth. Down syndrome, uh, the prevalence of periodontal disease is very high in children with Down syndrome. And the onset of disease is apparent even in the primary dentition. The periodontal disease is often very severe and especially in the upper and lower anterior teeth. 
and it can progress quite rapidly. Individuals with Down syndrome have an increased prevalence of periodontal disease compared with otherwise normal age match control groups. And most investigators agree that the oral hygiene is poor but not commensurate with the severity of the periodontal disease. And the severity is higher in subjects who are living in institutions rather than those who are cared for at home. Behavioural risk factors, very important. And smoking is one which has been studied extensively. An association between smoking and bone loss was first reported back in the 1950s by Verhoek. Cigarette smoking was identified to be an age-independent risk indicator for periodontal disease in uh, this large study in Michigan. And the data suggest a dose-effect relationship between the number of cigarettes smoked per day and the likelihood of developing periodontitis. And the research further estimated that more than 40% of cases of periodontitis among uh, adults can be attributed to current cigarette smoking. Individuals who cig uh, smoke cigarettes and pipes have six to seven times <coughs> more alveolar bone loss than non-smokers uh, in some studies carried out in the US and other countries. And patients with periodontitis, three to five times more likely to smoke than those without attachment loss. So smoking is a very significant factor. Also the role of stress. Many of us as clinicians have seen highly stressed individuals, and I'm sure uh, we're seeing lots of it at the present time with the economic crisis and there is a plausible uh, basis for this. It's suggested that stress is associated with more severe periodontal disease as well as poorer healing responses tradi to traditional periodontal therapy. But of course stress also causes behaviour modification. When you're stressed you might smoke more you might drink more and of course you might not brush your teeth quite as well either or spend as long and there are immunosuppressive effects as well and these result in a greater severity of periodontal disease as well as poorer wound healing. After dental plaque, poor oral hygiene, it's been suggested that obesity is second only to smoking as the strongest risk factor for inflammatory periodontal tissue destruction. And a positive association between obesity and periodontitis has recently been shown in animal and human studies. During pregnancy there are profound changes uh, in the immune system and uh, this can alter um, the course of a number of infection uh, occurring diseases. Those include uh, things like diabetes. Here's a pregnancy gingivitis where you can see the gums enlarged quite a lot. This lady, only 33 years of age, had had 11 pregnancies in 10 years. She had some ill-fitting crowns, a high smile line with incompetent lips, and resulted in severe inflammation which was extremely difficult to control. So very often there are multiple factors involved in such a condition. It's also been suggested that periodontal infections may increase the risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes. You may see strange things in pregnant patients, little growths that occur between the gums, the so-called pregnancy apulus, and you may even see these on the tongue and other tissues. During the course of a normal pregnancy there are profound changes occur in both mother and developing baby and some of the pregnancy induced immunological modifications in the mother increase her susceptibility to a number of infections including periodontal disease. 
and women with gestational diabetes during pregnancy may be at greater risk for developing more severe periodontal disease than pregnant women without um, a gestational diabetes. Also, you can see changes in the gingival tissues during and after the menopause. And quite often, uh, these are where the tissue or the gum tissue becomes thin and prone to inflammatory changes. And we may see where the tissues are very fragile and they may desquamate or they may peel off quite easily and become quite sore. And here is an example commonly seen. Also, we may see patients with Crohn's disease or orofacial granulomatosis, and these patients may also be prone to more severe periodontal breakdown. Drugs also influence the appearance on soft tissues, and here we see a, a lichenoid or striate appearance on the gums in response to an antihypertensive drug, and similarly here. So we have to remember that drugs can have a profound effect on our soft tissues. Overall, we need to consider that we're not dealing with any one particular risk factor when we're talking about periodontal disease. We're talking about multiple risk factors. And when we do out a patient's profile and we identify the various risk factors from their risk profile, we build up that profile, which we can use in terms of how we treat that patient. But those profiles change. Patients may stop smoking or start smoking, or they may get their diabetes under control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we need to keep modifying our profiles and, as a result, have a more accurate picture of our patient's risk. So the creation of specific risk profiles allows us to more accurately predict periodontal disease and its incidence and its progression. And this can provide a more scientific basis for deciding on when a patient should be recalled and what type of treatment they require. And there's a huge preventive benefit in terms of systemic periodontal interface and the potential benefit to general health. I treated this man many, many years ago, back in 1990. He's now in his 50s, and in his late 20s, he had early onset periodontal disease. He was a smoker, quite stressed, lots of clenching and grinding associated with his stress, a strong family history of periodontal disease, strong family history of coronary artery disease, family history of diabetes, and had a myocardial infarct or a heart attack at 31. If I had known the research then that I know now, I might have been able to help him a lot more. Thankfully, he's alive and well, and he's still got all his teeth. But now we've learned so much in that time uh, which has helped us to help our patients into the future. So in conclusion, although all risk factors cannot be modified, it now may be possible to identify people at risk for progressive periodontal disease and intervene to alter or modify some of these risks. The current theory that oral conditions may negatively affect systemic health are no longer largely unproven and speculative, but there still is a need for further continuing well-controlled studies to be carried out. And I'm sorry, I hope I haven't bored you with my hobby horse. And for my last slide, despite the obesity and all the rest of it, my dinner is waiting. Thank you very much. <laughs>I think the most important thing is that oral health, and particularly peri periodontal health or gum health, has to be considered as part of overall health because there are significant interrelationships between periodontal disease and other diseases, particularly chronic diseases. So an unhealthy periodontal condition 
may leave them at risk from other conditions and certain medical conditions may leave them at risk from periodontal disease. So that really would be my take home message.